Hello, everybody uh, from all parts of the world. Welcome to this webinar. Uh, Omar De Silva is my name. I am one of the co-founders and the co-CEO of Fourth Rev. And Fourth Rev has very proudly partnered with the London School of Economics uh, to bring to life the Career Accelerator, which you just got a little taster of. The Career Accelerator is a purpose-built educational experience which brings together the very best of industry-focused boot camp style education together with the very best uh, and the unique value that only institutions like the London School of Economics can deliver. The end result is a program which develops the technical skills that students need to be able to perform particular job roles that they aspire to fill, the business knowledge which allows that technical skill to become valuable and useful within an employment environment, the human skills so they can be wonderful colleagues, wonderful members of teams, and the personal skills so they can build their self-awareness, their critical thinking, and thus the ability for them to uh, take charge of their ongoing sustainable career success. Um, we're really proud uh, of the Career Accelerator. It's been a great privilege to be working with the London School of Economics. Uh, anybody that might be interested in learning more, there'll be a link in the chat for you to check it out. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us from whatever part of the globe you may be on. Um, I myself am in Melbourne, Australia. Um, from not so sunny Melbourne today, albeit being summer. Um, and again, it's great to connect with so many of you from all over the place. Um, in terms of our time together, we're going to get through this intro. We are going to open up the panel discussion in a few moments' time. We have some wonderful guests who we will introduce in a moment. We'll throw open the conversation for some audience Q&A and we'll wrap it up and have you out of here at half past the hour. Um, before we jump into it, just take a quick look at those house rules. Um, just so everybody knows, we are indeed recording this conversation. All of you here will get a copy of it after today. Um, it's all pretty straightforward. We're all very familiar with Zoom and, and video calls from the last couple of years, so I'm sure you're all pros. If you do have any issues, um, feel free to rejoin and or reach out to Candace, our moderator, via the chat, and she will be able to help you out. We're going to be asking for some engagement and some interaction, so please don't be afraid to get involved and, and again, post your questions in the chat, and we'll do our very best to get into all of them. Okay. We're going to, to open up with some introductions with our wonderful panelists. Uh, we're gonna go with Viet, then with Kelly, then with James. Viet, maybe you can just give everybody a one-line introduction of yourself before I uh, throw some rapid fire questions at you to get to know you just that little bit better. Sure, uh, I'm happy to do that. Um, hello everyone, my name is uh, Viet and I'm uh, currently a senior data scientist at the Credit Suisse um, based in Singapore. And I've been in this um, uh, data science um, uh, sort of job for the last uh, four years and a half, uh, I think, um, with various companies uh, all based in Singapore from uh, SAP to Agoda and now uh, with Credit Suisse. Wonderful. Thanks, Viet. Okay. I haven't given the panelists any warning, so they're a little bit nervous about these rapid fire questions, but they are very gentle and friendly. So Viet, starting with you, if you had to choose, are you watching live sport or are you watching a film? Um, I'm a film fan, so okay. <laughs> I'd rather watch a film. Tell me one of your favorite films. Doesn't have to be the favorite, but one of them. Um, I think The Matrix is one of my favorites. Good one. And what about A Guilty Pleasure? What's one of those movies that you don't like to admit that you love? Uh, well, um, I love horror movies in general. And okay. um, I would say that would make a lot of people scratch their heads. Huh, data scientists watching horror movies, huh? Good one. I like it. Tea or coffee? Which one are you choosing? Coffee. What's your, what's your coffee order? 
Um, just um, Blano and cappuccino, please. Nice and nice and straightforward. I like it. Uh, breakfast or dinner out? Which one are you choosing? I'd rather have breakfast at home and dinner out. Very, very uh, sensible. What's your what's your go to meal if you're out for a nice dinner? Um, I'd like Italian. Okay. So like some, nice some pizza or pasta. Can't go wrong. Classic. Last one. Netflix or a book? How about both? <laughs> why, <laughs> why not both? What do you what, yeah. what have you been enjoying on Netflix recently? Anything jump out for you? Um. Well, I I've been watching a lot of documentaries actually um, on Disney Plus. So um, I haven't watched Netflix for a while, to be honest. Yeah, but Disney Plus. I know Disney <laughs> Plus well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Moana is shows. on repeat. <laughs> Thanks, Viet. Looking forward to the conversation. All right, Kelly, over to you. Maybe just a quick intro before some rapid fires for you. Sure thing. Hi, everyone. It's really exciting to be here today. My name is Kelly Gauthier, um, and I am a specialist headhunter in the realm of AI and data science. And I have been doing this very exciting job for nearly 10 years now, um, based in London in the UK. I don't sound like I'm from London, and that's because I'm not. I'm originally from Canada, um, but I've been living in London for over 10 years now um, and really love helping bright talented uh, data professionals find jobs here in the UK and globally as well. Excellent. Thanks, Kelly. So are you Netflix or a book? So I love to read, but um, I have a hard time getting through more than two pages of a book without falling asleep, usually in the evenings. I've got two kids and run my own business. So I'm very busy. Um, so love, love a good book, but uh, usually it's uh, Netflix or something similar to that. Yeah, fair enough. Any Anything that you've seen this year that, that has been a particular favorite for you? Well, uh, I have to say like Viet, I, I, um, it's not on Netflix, but I'm very into succession at the moment. Um, watched it last night. It's a uh, it's, it's hard to look away, um, but it's not it necessarily uplifting television, I have to say. It's disturbingly good, isn't it? Um, so succession, I have, in, I have indeed got into it. Uh, and how about you? Are you going out for breakfast? Or are you going out for dinner? I love going out for a nice dinner, I have to say. And your cuisine and dish of choice, if you had to choose one? Um, well, in terms of type of cuisine I love Mexican food like really really uh when Mexican food is well done um it's absolutely delicious um haven't had the pleasure of going to Mexico yet but I'd like to someday but I have to say if I'm going to any old restaurant I'm probably ordering a burger because it's usually a pretty good safe bet yeah sensible good stuff and last one for you tea or coffee uh Love coffee, lifelong coffee addict, but tea first thing in the morning is a nice way to sort of gently wake you up. Um, tea is like a warm hug and coffee is like a punch in the face. So I like to start with that cup of tea. And then when I, when I need to get going, it's a coffee and that's what I'm drinking now. <laughs> Very London of you. Nice work. Thanks, <laughs> Kelly. Looking forward to the chat. Uh, and, and last, but of course, not least, James, uh, a quick intro for yourself, please. Thank you. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on your time zone. I expect you were geographically very uh, um, dispersed. So my name is uh, Dr. James Abdi. I am Associate uh, Professorial Lecturer. We love our long titles in academia um, at the London School of Economics and Political Science, to give it its uh, uh, full name. Um, I wear various uh, hats, as it were. So I lecture to um, uh, numerous uh, undergraduate students at the LSE. Uh, but I've also been dabbling in the uh, world of online education, and indeed I've been leading on uh, the development of our exciting new inaugural um, online career accelerator in uh, data analytics. Like Kelly, I am based here in London. It's uh, a bit chilly, but it is uh, the sun is just shining this morning, so it's quite nice. 
Nice work. And how about you, James? Are you watching live sport or a film? Uh, indeed, I've been listening to these questions. It's nice that it's the same to everyone, so I can predict these now. Um, um, I would say uh, a film, a film. And my most recent film, I'm a bit of a Bond fan, so it was the, the, the No Time to Die. And I won't give away any spoilers if anyone's not seen it, but um, it, uh, it, it, it hit home quite hard at the end. Very good, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, eagerly awaiting it. Actually, it's released here now in Australia just, and uh, looking forward to catching that one myself. What about one of the your guilty pleasure films that perhaps you're, you're not so proud of enjoying the way that you do? Um, um, I, I was briefly thinking about this. I would say, um, in terms of a film where I cried, now I didn't cry with No Time to Die, but I hear some people did, but um, there's a film I cried at, which perhaps most people wouldn't in, in an unexpected place, was the film Jaws, the original, when Jaws get, gets killed. And I, I felt slightly sad for, for, for the shark. Um, it was not his fault he was doing what he was doing in the film. I, do you know what? I've I've not seen yours, uh, believe it or not. So I'll, I'll I'll put it on the list, and when I do watch it, which won't be too far away, I'll um I'll think of you when. Uh, when well, I've not seen dies. I've not seen Star Wars, so that's probably as shocking, if not more. So. There we go. Uh, beer, wine, or soft drink? Um, I'm going to go for wine. Uh, I'd say uh, red wine. Um, be a Merlot. Very nice. And are you, I was going to say you're going to have that with breakfast or dinner out, but presumably um, you'd have I, that with I, dinner I, out, I, but which <laughs> are you going for? Uh, I will admit for this for dinner out, yes. <laughs> nice, nice work. And and how about a, a recent television show or book that you've come across that you reckon is worth everybody giving a shot? The, the one that really I, I got slightly addicted to a few weeks ago was uh, Squid Game. And um, uh, also from, from an analytical perspective, and indeed I, I tried to bring in the real world, not I'm saying Squid Game is, is reality necessarily, but I tried to bring it into my lectures and we were analyzing one or two of the, the games in Squid Game from a more sort of statistical perspective. So in particular, there's the, the, the glass bridge and these sort of glass stepping stones and thinking strategically, I mean, while the odds are not good, for anyone, um, what's best to do and thinking strategically, if you were in that position, um, how you want to at least sort of maximize your chance of, of making it across. So um, I'm looking forward to season two. Very good, great stuff. All right, folks, let's, um, let's transition into the chat to help us do that. Um, we are about to release a quick poll for you, which should pop up right in front of you. Relatively straightforward question, but how are you thinking about your career at the moment? Pop through your answer, and uh, let's let's see what we find. Conversation is, of course, data careers and everything around it. So don't be shy; it's all anonymous, of course. I think as those answers start to come through, we will start to get some of those findings. Great stuff. Okay, so here we go. We've just finished studying and looking to start a career in data uh, at 9%. I'm looking to make a career change into a more data-oriented role or data-oriented role, depending on what part of the world you're in, 27%. I'd like to advance my data skills to level up in my existing data role, 59% and 5% fall into the others. So um, we've got about 10% of starters, about 25% of career switches, and we've got about 60% of, uh, of career advances. Excellent, great context to help us frame our conversation. Um, we're about to get into it, just a reminder, don't be shy. Post your questions in the chat, and uh, let's let's get into it. Hey, we're going to start with you, Kelly. You've got um, a decade plus of experience of, of recruitment and looking for the, the best talent within the data industry. Um, let's start with what does great talent look like if there is such a thing within the wider data industry. Yeah, really good question. Um, and I want to preface my answers by saying that there's obviously a wide range of roles when we're talking about data 
positions or data professions. So I'm going to caveat my response by saying that I'm sure I won't touch on everything, but I'll try and cover the main bases. Um, and my expertise lies primarily in helping um, candidates, experienced candidates to find data science oriented roles, but I have some exposure to data analytics and data engineering as well. I would say by and large, um, uh, companies are looking for candidates who have skills and experience with usually the same list of uh, technical tools. Um, Python is, is the ever popular tool of choice um, for, for roles that involve any sort of machine learning or predictive analysis. Um, and that includes, uh, that includes the associated machine learning libraries. Um, so uh, candidates are, are, you know, are well positioned if they have experience with those types of tools, as well as things like SQL. Um, SQL is a query language, as most of you will know, and it's something that a lot of uh, data, well, most data related roles will require some experience and proficiency in. Um, and experience with visualization tools um, like Tableau and Power BI are probably the most popular ones. So that's kind of the technical skill set that would make a data related professional. Um, you know, come across as a, as a viable candidate for sure. Um, and increasingly now experience with deployment tools. So um, tools that allow machine learning models to be run in production environments, things like Docker and Kubernetes. Um, so like the more machine learning engineering uh, oriented tools are becoming increasingly popular and in high demand um, by employers. But um, more broadly speaking, I think candidates who will be more interest interesting to employers also have, you know, excellent communication skills, are, you know, approaching problems with, with a curious mind and with humility, um, and uh, have a lot of uh, team spirit and, and like to collaborate because, as um, my uh, podcast co-host, um, Greg Detra here in London said to me before, which I think is really astute, is data science is a, a, multi, uh, a multidisciplinary team sport. So it, not just one person can perform every task in the world of data analytics and data science. So you have to come to problem solving with a real uh, collaborative spirit. Excellent, thanks Kelly. Um, and, and so Viet, I might just throw to you now, you've mm -hmm. recently gone through a job search and a job transition and, and made the move to Credit Suisse, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. in, from your opinion and, and, and in your experience, what do you think allowed you to stand out um, from the crowd, if you like, and, and be successful in your job search? What were some of the things that you felt that employers were really looking for? Yeah, sure. Um, I think a couple of things that um, I'd like to mention. Um, so number one is um, basically how do you present yourself on um, say professional social um, networking websites um, such as LinkedIn, Indeed, and also your CV because that's what, that is where most of the jobs are and that is where most of the um, recruiters are actively looking for um, their candidates. Um, uh, so for me, I try to um, maintain um, kind of like the most uh, up-to-date CV and I kind of like, you know, use all of those um, tools and functions at the website to, to tell recruiters, hey, I'm actually, I'm actually on the job market um, and trying to list on all, all of the projects that um, that you've done to kind of like prove your skill sets, your qualifications, your education, etc. So try to have a really comprehensive and uh, kind of also attractive presentation on this mainstream professional social media network. I'm sorry, <laughs> social network. Um, and then um, also you, um, for me, I think the skills are really important because um, when you actually got um, attention from the recruiters and um, after some conversation and going to the interviews, that, that is where you kind of like present your skills. So those skills um, uh, are, um, whether they're from your job experiences, from your education, whether it's formal education or, more informal education like online and um, project work or open source contribution um, are really uh, going to be tested 
when you go through this rounds of interview. Um, and also another thing is, um, uh, how do you really discover those opportunities? So um, it's not just you're sitting there waiting for people to approach you, but it's also important that um, for me, I kind of like, um, I go on this virtual networking. So like I, um, I subscribe to certain newsletters, for example, um, Andrew Ng is one of the, uh, a uh, machine learning guru, if, if I can put it. Um, he has this kind of like the batch uh, newsletter about all this latest developments um, uh, and thought leadership in, uh, you know, AI and uh, ML industry and also some of those opportunities there. And also I kind of attend those um, webinars. Um, one of my favorite is the AI for Good, which is, um, uh, actually they do have like a YouTube channel even. So it's a, a webinar um, about very interesting um, and socially uh, impactful applications of, of, uh, of AI to, you know, to solve a wide variety of uh, problems from climate change to uh, equality to finance to 5G networks, etc. Um, and uh, typically they also have, you know, like announcements about, you know, these opportunities, that opportunities. So, uh, so those are the examples, uh, you know, some of the virtual networking that um, uh, if you're on the market, you can attain and you can get a lot of uh, information from that. Um, another thing that I'd like to add on to is um, the way you kind of like demonstrate your skill set to recruiters is by participating in some kind of like um, either hackathon, um, machine learning um, competition on um, you know um, platforms like um, Kaggle, or doing some kind of side projects that you can kind of like enrich and showcase your portfolio to the recruiters and also put on the um, uh, professional social um, network. So so yeah, so those basically uh, sort of main points. Yeah, thanks, Viet. Kelly, I'm just gonna come back to you just, just real quick. So you've got the technical skills, you talked about some of the, the things that we like to talk about as human skills and Viet sort of talked about that with being proactive and getting himself out there and being part of events. Um, in your experience, why is it difficult to find great talent within the data industry? Well, I think that part of the problem is that there's an ever increasing demand. So ever and ever since I've been working in this space, uh, starting in 2013, the demand for talent has always exceeded the supply of talent, which means that, um, you know, <laughs> the requirements of the job being as they are, you know, there aren't, there aren't ever sort of a surplus of people who kind of represent you know, skills in kind of the three main areas that you typically see um, with a data related professional, which is sort of a strong set of communication and consulting skills, um, strong kind of hacking skills or sort of engineering or coding skills, or maybe with a data analyst role, just simply like SQL and sort of um, being able to use the right programs, Excel, that sort of thing. And also the, the skills around quantitative analysis. It's a tough, it's a tough combo, to be honest with you. So, um, you know, the fact that more and more companies now, I mean, we all know that broadly speaking, you know, there's never been more data in the world and it's being created exponentially more and more every day. There's endless data to be mined and um, sort of monetized and capitalized on by companies. And so the demand is increasing more and more. And uh, thank goodness for, for, for companies like Forthrev and the, and the Career Accelerator who are trying to upskill candidates so that they can try and meet this demand. But I think, I think it's, it's really down to um, the combination of skills that data professionals have to have is quite unique. And um, there's, just, there's just an ever increasing demand. So there's, there's a bit of a, a sort of a, a shortage there. And um, to overcome that, and I don't know if I'm preempting a question, but it definitely helps. Uh, it definitely helps for candidates and companies to be aligned with people who can help them navigate that. So people like myself, recruiters, or just experts who understand what's happening in the market, um, who can help connect great people with companies that can that can employ them and empower them. Yeah, makes perfect sense. James, going to bring you in here. Um, Kelly sort of referenced that that skills gap, the increasing demand, and perhaps the supply of, of talent not keeping up. What have, what have you noticed and what do you see the educational sector doing to respond to this sort of in continuously increasing demand for such skill sets? 
Indeed. Well, I mean, I, this was skills gap. I think of it as like a skills deficit. And indeed, you know, the demand vastly exceeds supply. And I think the, uh, the magnitude of that skills deficit is just growing over time. Now, for people joining this session, I mean, this is good news for you, because if you uh, are looking to transition into a, a data uh, focused career or um, um, uh, 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 um, or up to the next level in your particular uh, organization. I mean, I think there are numerous opportunities to do so. From the education sector perspective, um, I would say higher education in particular can be, I'm not, I wouldn't say resistant to change, but it can be quite sclerotic and slow moving and slow to adapt. Now, I mean, my view is, I mean, as I've sort of chosen academia as my sort of profession, that from a teaching perspective, we owe it to all of our students at whatever level of study it may be to prepare them for what comes next. And for the vast majority that is your careers in the real world. And so it, it, I think it falls upon us to design uh, courses, programs of study, which will meet the, the demands of employers. And um, particularly I've enjoyed been working on this um, new career accelerator is because we're trying our best to blend these were multiple or multifaceted skill set. And so Kelly was uh, mentioning on, on many of those themes. So yes, there's the technical skills, being able to do a bit of programming. I think there's one or two uh, Q&A questions on, on, on that. And, but also particularly the communication skills. And I think it's that aspect which is often forgotten or not given sufficient prominence in sort of programs of study with a sort of data and analytics theme. So yes, I mean, technical skills, that, that's really a, a given, but being able to communicate your uh, results, your insights to a, a, an audience. Now, of course, depending on who that audience is, you must always know your audience to know how best to present those results. So of course, you may be speaking with uh, like-minded technical uh, people, uh, but very often it's to a more uh, lay audience. And so you do need, be, do, do need to be able to explain often quite um, complicated concepts in very easy to understand bite-sized terms, such that let's say the decision makers in an organization, they just need to know what to do, or what you are, uh, what recommendations you're making based on your, your data um, analysis. So something like a career accelerator is a great um, uh, mode of delivery. I mean, not just that it's online, but sort of flexible format of study, and sort of, uh, with LSE partnering with Fort Rev, we can really uh, blend the academic theory that the technical skills with the applied and practical skills um, in collaboration with, with various industry partners. So I think the Career Accelerator is a great tool to try and get you know, the best of not just both worlds, but the best of, of all worlds to try and build uh, well-rounded individuals who can really make a, a, a powerful impact in their day-to-day -day jobs. Yeah, thanks, James. Um, some of the things that we talked about there uh, are arguably quite transferable. So Kelly, I'm going to come back to you here. Um, with regards to learning and developing your capabilities and your skills as a data professional, is it the case that once you've gone into one sector or one, yeah, one, one field that you're sort of stuck there for your career or are there indeed transferable skill sets which are going to be valuable in various sectors in, in various markets? Great question. Um, I was actually speaking to someone about this yesterday. I've got a, I've got someone working for me at the moment that was asking me about um, the difference between someone working in, in financial services as a data scientist um, and uh, moving into consulting as a data scientist, um, and then subsequently into uh, sort of a product focused kind of startup environment whether there's continuity there. And I would say that there, there absolutely is. Um, and there's lessons to be learned from each of those environments. I think historically, actually, a lot of the people who now form like the majority of, of the sort of data, data professionals would have worked in something like financial services where that quantitative skill set was more in demand and kind of identified um, earlier on. There's always been a lot of sort of data in financial service, a lot of numerical data a need for um, predictive analysis when it comes to predicting, you know, share share prices and stocks and all that kind of stuff, investment opportunities. Um, and so, um, and there's still a huge need, well, Viet can talk about this, um, I'm sure, but there's still a huge need for those types of professionals. But I would say that um, companies aren't so concerned with the industry 
you come from when you're applying to a job. In fact, like it's usually just sort of a nice to have to have had some sort of exposure to the industry that the job exists in. What's more relevant when applying to a new job is um, the sort of data you've worked with. And when I say the sort of data, I'm not, I don't mean like, you know, uh, relating to a specific uh, product or a specific industry, but more like whether it's numerical data or text data, you know, the kind, and, and that, you know, is, is across all industries and can be sort of found in any kind of company, depending on the, the kind of work you're doing. Um, but that's definitely the more relevant question. And I think that they, you know, a lot of companies actually really welcome candidates who are coming from different industries. You know, for example, um, I'm working with a client at the moment that actually really likes candidates coming out of consulting because they will have been exposed to projects in, you know, various industries um, in all likelihood in, in their career as a, as a consultant data scientist. Um, and bringing that breadth of experience and knowledge is hugely valuable because you will have learned lessons in each of those projects and you can bring them to whatever domain you're now going to be working in. Um, so, yeah. Excellent. And so, James, back to you for a moment. When it comes to actually learning and doing a course of study or doing a program, is it possible to learn these skills and learn these capabilities in such a way that they are indeed transferable and applicable across industries? Indeed. If I could just quickly pick up on a point Kelly just made about you know, yeah. particularly having people from different sort of industry backgrounds. And I think it's great to try and avoid sort of group think. And if you've got people from different sectors, they approach problems in different ways. Because ultimately, I think to, to succeed with data, it's about problem solving. Mm -hmm. And um, I think to your question, Omar, about a key thing the accelerator tries to do is to um, try and train uh, learners to, to know how to interrogate the data, to know what kind of questions to ask of the data. As Kelly mentioned, there's no shortage of data out there. The critical shortage of the, is with people with the right kind of skills to extract value from the data. And I always think a, a nice analogy, I mean, it's been suggested that data is the new oil. Well, in terms of volume, I'd say no, but in terms of a value add, yes, in that the crude oil is pretty useless. It's only after you've refined it into a useful purpose, that's when you get your real value add. Likewise, I'd say with data, no shortage of data out there, as Kelly says, or exponentially increasing the volume, but um, it's about converting that data to sort of information and ultimately insights. So um, you know, while again, technical skills are important, it's knowing where to, to get started. And I think Kelly also mentioned about the collaborative nature of many sort of projects. And typically people are not gonna be working on their own, they're gonna be part of a team. And if you can bring in people from a wide variety of backgrounds and sectors and experiences, we all view the world through our own eyes and from our own perspectives. Uh, and if you're getting people from um, different industries, they will view the world from those different perspectives. And when you put all of those together, um, I think you know, the, the, the uh, output or the value add from the team is likely to be greater than the sum of the individual parts. So, I mean, in the very early weeks of the accelerator, it's a real focus on sort of being able to define you know, the business problem from a sort of variety of kind of uh, sector examples uh, before you go about trying to solve that problem. Because you, you need to know what questions you need to answer before you can try and actually answer them. And I, I think a lot of people when they start to dabble with data, they're, they're just sort of overwhelmed by the sheer volume of it. And they sort of almost drown in the data and just don't know how to get started. So I think that's a very important first step. And we really emphasize that in the uh, early days of the accelerator. Thanks, James. Viet, you've, you've lived this and experienced this firsthand. How has the transition been between different sectors and has it been beneficial for you where you've been able to bring as James talked about, a different perspective and a different way of looking at problems. What's that experience been like for you? Yeah, it's, I think it's definitely, it was uh, it was a big value added um, to my application, I would say, because um, uh, I remember when I was interviewing for this position, one of uh, you know the things that Riku was saying that they actually, they're really, um, they're actively looking for people, you know, like candidates from outside of financial services because, you know, like they're like a big bank uh, and they, they have just like so many people thinking the same and look at data from the same angle. So um, 
um, they really value, you know, people with kind of a different mindset, um, different kind of curiosity and inquisition when it comes to looking at the data, analyzing data, uh, asking questions, uh, looking for those answers to questions. So, uh, so yes, yeah, certainly um, with uh, kind of like um, I spent a couple of years uh, doing it. Um, doing data science for um, e-commerce. So that kind of like, it brings in uh, you know, different perspective when I was doing interviewing, doing kind of um, you know, assignment for those job applications, uh, particularly in this uh, financial services company. Um, yeah, so uh, totally agree with uh, what Jim said. And the, uh, in, in addition to you know, bringing into your current role, a broader perspective from outside of the financial services sector. Mm -hmm. What do you think that, whether it be your current employer or, or just other employers out there, what are the specific skills that you think uh, are being sought after at the moment? Where is the most value being created from what you're seeing? Yeah, um, I think in general, um, uh, so when you talk about like, you know, big data, there has to be, um, you know, skills in you know things like big data tooling things like hadoop spark how do you kind of like handle and scale up those you know huge amount of data uh, transform them through a pipeline putting up on the infrastructure ready to be used for you know kind of like model training and deployment so those traditional tools like you know like as i say spark hadoop but also as well as the uh, standard database systems and SQL, um, and also um, skills such as uh, data cleaning, visualization, storytelling, and mapping, you know, those, you know, data and technologies into business uh, problems and requirements is uh, very, very important because eventually when you kind of like go into the job market, doing interviews and actually doing your, your real job, um, you're going to be interacting with people from across different uh, kind of like business sectors in a company and typically you have to be able to talk in the languages that you know people outside of you can appreciate and can understand and can see the value um, so so yeah so just to emphasize on uh, the um, skills are just uh, visualization storytelling and uh, communications is it, also very very important uh, especially when it comes to you know um, interviewing uh, in those um, you know um, sort of non-tech companies like financial services. It's, of course, if you, you say you're interviewing, you know, for like Google and Facebook and Amazon, definitely those people, they wouldn't care so much about the way you present, communicate. But outside of those, you know, the big tech companies, uh, I think it's, it, it really adds a lot of value into your um, kind of like uh, application. Yeah, so James, I might, um, I might throw to you here. Viet's talked about, obviously plenty of technical skills, but something that jumps out to me is the fact that it's not just about the technical skills for the sake of it, but instead it's about the technical skills so you can create value. And um, I can't remember exact words that Viet used, but you know, the creating an appropriate application for the organization for them to achieve what it is that, that they're looking for, as well as the ability to talk to people who are perhaps non-tech and have a, a chance for them to understand the Career Accelerator has got a project-based approach to learning and, and it has the employer partner project within the program. Um, maybe you can just talk a little bit about that, why that approach, and I think that will help to sort of um, answer a couple of the open questions that we've got as well in terms of supporting career prospects through, through the learning experience. Indeed. Well, perhaps to consolidate many of the themes we've been hearing in, in recent um, sort of minutes. So, so the Career Accelerator itself is formed of, sort of three courses, followed by this sort of employer a sort of capstone project at the end. And course by course, it's about developing different kinds of skill sets. So we start off with sort of the, the basic uh, Excel, a strong focus on data visualization. Uh, we use uh, Tableau uh, instead of uh, Power BI. Um, and I think data visualization is... Um, uh, we're starting to see more of it just in everyday life. So if you think about the pandemic, I mean, we've all seen sort of COVID charts on sort of the mainstream uh, news media to try and convey vast quantities of information, hopefully very concisely, efficiently uh, and effectively. 
So um, data visualization, it's a form of storytelling, but um, I would say stories of uh, fact rather than, than fiction, because these are stories driven by data and hopefully a good uh, quality and, and reliable data. So having defined a business problem and done some exploratory uh, sort of data analysis with sort of pivot tables in Excel versus um, visualizations in Tableau, then leads into um, uh, databases, so a strong focus on SQL or SQL, depending how you uh, pronounce it. Um, then moving into developing more of the technical skills, so programming, primarily using Python, and also uh, touching on R, and in uh, course three, touching on some uh, advanced uh, analytics. And then basically, that the employer project is an opportunity to consolidate that um, vast skill set in solving a real world problem you know, posed by, uh, by an employer. And um, I, I would really like to stress the importance of, of those communication uh, skills, because I think most people, when they think about a data uh, oriented career, their mindset sort of focuses on the technical and your, how much your programming experience do I need, et cetera, et cetera. That's not to say that's not important, but it, it should not be thought of at the expense of the ability to, to communicate. And often you will be communicating to a non-technical audience. And for me, something like data visualization is an amazing medium to convey huge amounts of information very efficiently and effectively. And it's often said, well, a picture speaks a thousand words. Well, I think a good uh, visualization, and there are many bad ones out there, but a good visualization I think would speak a thousand data points or indeed very more uh, than that. So we try to take a more sort of holistic uh, approach across the accelerator, admittedly focusing on, on one skill set area at a time, but trying to blend all of these, combine these to really optimize the um, overall skill set learners have such that they can really make um, uh, impact um, by the, uh, the end of their studies. Thanks, James. Kelly, so, so that project that, that James has just talked to us a little bit about, the culminating project, the employer project, as we talk about it, um, there's, a, there's a, a global software consultancy, ThoughtWorks, they provide a brief which students respond to, and um, students are completing a project which uh, requires them to demonstrate the technical skills, the human skills, their business acumen, the ability to collaborate, and um, using all of those skills and using all of those capabilities produce something of, of value that responds to the brief which has been provided. My question for you, Kelly, is um, how valuable is it for somebody who perhaps is trying to break into the industry to be able to have something that they can talk about where they can show what they're capable of and they can talk with experience around the value that they can create for a business and within for an organization? And I suppose a second part to that, you know, does, does a program from an LSE add value in addition uh, beyond that just project experience as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would say that that's the differentiator, to be honest with you, um, between candidates that are kind of readily employed and those who maybe struggle a little bit is being able to demonstrate some kind of track record of having worked with real world commercial usually, or, you know, just general kind of open data that's available, metadata, um, where, you know, they've done the work and they've demonstrated building a product potentially, I mean, or a proof of concept rather, or, um, you know, having demonstrated the potential value add from having done that, that modeling and um, analysis um, makes a huge difference. Um, and, and, you know, um, I mean, in my experience, programs like the Career Accelerator are, are hugely important for elevating people coming straight out of an undergraduate degree or a master's degree, um, even if their even if their background is very quantitative or computer science focused, um, you know, there's there's a gap that needs to be bridged, and it's often with you know uh, experience of having worked with not just sort of theoretical problems, but actual um, real life commercial problems. It doesn't necessarily have to be commercial; it could be you know, um, something to do with, uh, I mean, there's tons of data around right now around pandemics and, you know, epidemiology, that sort of thing, being able to demonstrate trends in, in, in health worldwide, 
um, it, you know, being able to seek out your own kind of projects. I, there are also lots of platforms available where you can participate in competitions like Kaggle, for example, is a really popular one that data scientists like to engage on where they have access to those kinds of real world data sets and can participate in competitions where they demonstrate that skill. And that's the kind of thing you can put on your CV. You know, uh, for years now, candidates of mine who are trying to, you know, advance their data careers will, will put their Kaggle rank, ranking on their CV to demonstrate their proficiency um, with those kinds of projects. And that's hugely valuable because it just, it reinforces that you can work with different types of data and that you understand that your modeling needs to have an impact. You know, it needs to add value. It can't just be, you know, unless you're in a very research oriented role, there needs to be some sort of value add with the projects that you're undertaking. So I think, I think, yeah, absolutely hugely valuable and something that, that companies are looking for more and more. Thanks, Kelly. The, uh, you talked before about some of those proactive things that you did. Um, was there one? Was there one thing in particular that, for those who are are, are on the, the not the call but on the webinar, thinking about breaking into industry, is there one thing that you would recommend them to do, which really helped you when it came to that proactive building of portfolio or, or networking um, or anything else? Um, I would say that um, I'm actually a big fan of uh, MOOC, um, so M-O-O-C. Um, so I, um, I enrolled in a lot of those um, sort of like online courses on Coursera, which is um, um, a really, really good uh, channel if you want to learn like mini courses on machine learning. And for example, you want to really learn about NLP and TensorFlow and these very specialized technologies in machine learning so that you can kind of like uh, have really, you know, proof that, you know, uh, you've done this course and you've passed, you, you, you pass the assignments and the exams and you can showcase your badges on, for example, LinkedIn on your CV. So that's what I've been doing for the past couple of years is that like I try to, um, uh, you know, uh, keep myself um, updated and educated with, you know, the, you know, the latest things going on um, in, in the world of machine learning and data science by through, you know, different kinds of uh, MOOCs. Um, besides that, I also used to, you know, participate in, um, in Kaigo, which, uh, you know, like years ago when it was in, in university, which uh, one of the very first CVs that I, you know, when it was in job market years ago, when it was applying for jobs, of course, there's this cargo ranking, you know, like in the top 20 of that project, of that particular competition, it was there, but now I, I don't think it's relevant anymore. Um, but still, I, you know, um, definitely it is kind of like a really good stepping stone uh, for you to break into this industry is to, uh, is to get your hands dirty and to really, um, uh, you know, uh, compete yourself among uh, others. Um, yeah, so um, that's that's basically uh, my uh, my two kind of uh, uh, opinions. Great, thank thanks for that, um, James. As a as a transition into to some some more open Q and A from the audience, some of those themes that Biet's talked about. Um, I know that the Career Accelerator has been built to respond to. So again, we've got a lot of questions program specific. And so perhaps as a transition into answering some of those, maybe you can talk a little bit about how the CA has been designed and, and some of those gaps that it's been, uh, you know, it's trying to fill and, and how it's trying to fill those um, gaps in, I suppose, more traditional programs. Indeed. Well, I think First of all, one has to have a, a realistic expectation of any program of study, be it online, offline, undergraduate, postgraduate, or whatever. Any program is finite, and no program can ever teach every single thing that anyone will ever need to know for the rest of their, their careers. And, um, and I think you know, from the uh, participants today, I mean, most are already working professionals and they are looking to reskill or upskill um, uh, up, up, uh, up in the sort of data um, uh, arena. So what the Career Accelerator aims to do is to, to try to get the best of, of all worlds. Now, again, just to transition, I've been keeping an eye on the Q&A um, function as well. 
So, uh, for example, in terms of software, we've heard uh, several mentioned um, during this session, uh, of course, uh, database management, so things like SQL, SQL, uh, uh, data visualization tools. Uh, we've opted for Tableau over Power BI, because of the um, uh, Tableau is an industry partner, if I'm not mistaken, of course, Rev. On the programming front, we prioritized Python, but added in a little bit of R uh, as well, and also some basic uh, Excel uh, skills. So, I mean, you know, just take um, you know, uh, software programming languages as uh, one aspect. I mean, there are countless things out there, and no one's uh, no one is ever going to know everything uh, perfectly, and no one's going to be an expert in everything. Um, so, um, I always think when developing technical skills, uh, an analogy is like foreign languages. I mean, there are thousands of languages spoken around the world, and even the most polyglot among us at best in a lifetime could probably be proficient in what maybe 10 languages, the world's leader, and such that there's going to be countless languages you, you don't know. But I, I think education, be it a career accelerator, a degree or whatever, if I put my economist hat on, it's about um, signaling, okay? signaling what you've learned, but also your aptitude for learning. And Piet mentioned uh, quite rightly about MOOCs, um, these sort of bite-sized courses in a whole array of areas. And there's countless stuff online to do a little bit of self-study on, such that um, something like a career accelerator is really emphasizing the ability not just to study, but to study collaboratively, a lot of uh, group work, be it formative or summative, in culminating uh, in that um, uh, employer uh, project, but you know, to, to really focus on, on, on how to learn such that at the end of the career accelerator, there will still be new skills you will need to pick up in the remainder of your careers. Um, but of course, you'll be uh, picking up uh, those skills on a need to know and a need to use basis. So no one's, no one's ever gonna know uh, everything. One has to be uh, uh, realistic. But um, I think the career accelerator gives a very strong foundation on, on which to build a uh, longer term. So we've in and we spent uh, many, um, a, a, larger amount of time uh, thinking about the structure of the career accelerator. What skills do we wish to impart in learners and how best to um, sort of explicitly build that into the, the curriculum. So while there are individual courses that they're not these sort of individual silos, they're not mutually exclusive. They very much um, feed into each other in a, a natural sort of cumulative way, such that you, but by the end of those sort of whole six months of the program, I'd like to think that uh, someone you know, entering uh, a data career in whichever sector, uh, they will be able to identify uh, not just one, but hopefully multiple problems, know how to go about solving those problems, have the technical skills, so you build a, an algorithm, which is perhaps bespoke for the problem at hand, to be able to interpret results, draw insights. Remember converting the crude oil to some more useful uh, uh, function, well, likewise with the data to convert, refine the raw data uh, into something meaningful where there's significant uh, value add, and ultimately to take decisions. It's not just about finding interesting features in data, it's doing something with it. And so having these sort of data-driven um, decision-making and being able to convince the decision makers in an organization, which often will not be the people doing the actual analytics itself, such that you need to be persuasive, you need to be able to convince them why you are right and why they should follow your data-driven recommendations. Now, that perhaps also sounds quite ambitious overall, but I like to think, uh, while this is LSE's first a career accelerator, and I've been very pleased with the development of that program. And I'm very confident that people who've gone through that six month process, you know, if we consider uh, from where they are at the start to where they are at the end, I mean, they really will have transformed themselves you know, professionally, uh, technical skills, communication skills, uh, et cetera. And I think it's a very nice sort of evolutionary process that we've uh, built into it. And we call it an accelerator. I think within the program itself, there is this degree of acceleration. I don't think people should think it's a sort of linear acquisition of, of skills. Um, uh, we start off with the basics, visualizations, pivot tables in Excel, et cetera, but then very quickly sort of we ramp up the difficulty level. And so there is a steep acceleration in the acquisition of, of those skills. So uh, not for the faint hearted, but um, you know, no pain, no gain. And I think you know, this has a real um, you know, opportunity to uh, make people far more marketable and attractive prospects uh, in, the, in the job market. That's my sales pitch. <laughs>
<laughs> good, good job, James. Um, thanks, thanks. I, I'm, I'm, I, I might just uh, add a, a couple of things to respond to, to some of the questions which have come through. Um, so a really important part of um, the Career Accelerator philosophy and, and the reason why it's been designed the way it has is through extensive engagement with industry in the form of major employers as well as recruiters. And what the consistent theme has been, which has been touched on by everybody tonight, is that it's not just about having one, one skill set. It's about that holistic development so you can actually add value as a member of a team within an organization and fulfill a role as opposed, as opposed to complete a task. And so as a result of that, or, or from those learnings, throughout the program as a student, uh, at the commencement of the program, depending on where you are at in your career journey, the first thing that you'll do is set goals for yourself. What does success look like for you as an individual and with your job and your career hat on? And then from those goals, you'll have a success coach and a careers coach that will work with you on a very regular basis to have a, a personalized support plan for you to progress specifically towards you achieving your goals. And that will, of course, pick up on the technical skills and the business skills. But intrinsically, or, or um, I suppose implicitly within that, is also your human skills and your personal skills. Depending on your job and career goals, those career coaches will work with you, again, on a very regular basis in a one-on-one -on -one setting, as well as making available one-to-many type masterclasses. Those career coaches will help you develop your CV, will help you develop your portfolio of evidence, will help you build the presentation skills, your interview skills, et cetera. And through working with people like Kelly and like others, the global employment network that we have, those career coaches will be looking for opportunities that match your goals and fit the opportunities, or sorry, fit the capabilities that you've been developing through the program as well. So it's a career accelerator with really acute focus on job and career outcomes. And that means building the skills, building the capabilities, demonstrating those capabilities through completing a, an employer partner project, and then proactively trying to match you with the opportunities that are available through our wider uh, fourth rev network. So hopefully that, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. And then a question for you, Kelly, that sort of come through to, to help um, a couple of people here, programming. Um, from a program, sorry, from a career accelerator perspective, I'll just say that your programming experience um, can be very, very little and even minimal uh, or none, rather. You learn programming from the ground up. But Kelly, in, in industry and, and in, in role, how critical is, is a huge bank of programming experience um, or is it not about the programming and it's more about what you do with the programming? I think it really depends on the role um, as sort of a first kind of answer. So, you know, if you want to, if you want to be a data engineer, I would say that programming is probably the most important thing that you need to upskill on because your job is primarily to wrangle and clean and transform and load the data um, as opposed to you know, visualizing, you know, the results of modeling that you've been doing and communicating that. So I would say that, you know, emphasis definitely on programming in that sense and something that, you know, you probably want to be upskilling on in your spare time. You want to explore, you know, other programming languages outside of just Python, um, just to kind of round out your skill set. Um, I think otherwise, um, you know, I, I don't think that there are many, again, it depends on, on the sort of job you're applying to, but, um, you know, if you're moving into your first, for example, data related role, maybe from a different sort of career path, there isn't so much emphasis initially, usually on being able to write quote unquote production quality code, which is kind of the level of, of programming or coding that you might see from like a dedicated, you know, software engineer. 
it's more about being able to um, use use the tools available well enough to be sort of dangerous, I guess, but, um, you know, not necessarily having, you know, a complete hacker mentality. And, and like I said, sort of programming like a software engineer, I think as, um, as James said, you know, um, there are so many different languages out there, you know, and no one expects you to be a, an expert at all of them. I think an aptitude and an interest in learning those programming languages and then having a good handle on the basics is usually enough. And then as your career progresses and you become more specialist in a specific area, then I would expect you to become more, more and more proficient with tools that are specific to the area that you specialize in. So, you know, for example, if you're becoming a specialist in natural language, you might become more specialist with the machine learning libraries that are often associated with analyzing um, unstructured data or um, text or, uh, you know, general language data. So, so yeah, I think, um, you know, having a good foundation is vital, um, but the level of proficiency you need to have with different languages really depends on the path you want your career to take. Yeah, great. A, a, a question for everyone. How, as you're, as you get into some lesser stages of your career um, as a data professional, what does that transition look like? There've been a couple of questions around this sort of being at later stages of career. Um, my beginner's mind expects that the further advanced you get, the less you're actually on the tools and the more it's about the leadership and the business value and, and the joining of the dots of the insights which are being produced. Is that indeed the case? I can go ahead and answer this, um, Omar, just to begin, because I'm yeah. working on a couple of leadership data related leadership searches at the moment that I think speak to this pretty specifically. Um, Cause often the candidate pool is composed of people who were once very hands-on either as data analysts or data scientists um, as individual contributors, and then have slowly um, progressed into more leadership oriented roles or more senior roles. And that's not necessarily the path that everyone's career is gonna take, but often it is. Um, and in those cases, as your career progresses and you move um, into a more senior role, the expectation is, is less that you be, you know, able to uh, program really proficiently with Python day to day and be sort of at the coal face of the problem solving and very much more thinking strategically about, um, you know, things like how uh, the work of the team will have a broader impact on the company's goals, you know, working very closely with company leadership, um, thinking about the professional development of the people working for you, obviously, and making sure that the team is growing in accordance with uh, company goals um, and commercial goals for that company. Um, and also just thinking more broadly about how, you know, the team or uh, the wider company can adopt the latest tools and technologies to make sure that they're remaining competitive against, uh, you know, other companies doing similar things in the market. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I, mean, I think this, yeah, this is sort of this, the more sort of senior leadership positions, it is more that sort of that strategic uh, view. But uh, um, I think my analogy is about like you know, for a senior manager to have some experience on, on the shop floor regularly. So perhaps maybe not in their day to day uh, leadership roles are they needing to do any sort of coding, but it's perhaps always good to keep um, uh, your, your skill set somewhat um, you know, refreshed occasionally. So it's almost akin to going back to spending a little bit of time on the shop floor so you can um, yeah, be up to speed with some of the, the latest uh, sort of technical uh, trends but also being able to speak across an organization such that I think really effective people are those who can act as like a bridge between the technical people that's doing a lot of the heavy coding versus maybe the consumers of the output of that coding who are perhaps from a very non-technical background. And I think where um, there is lots of skills deficits out there, but one is finding people who are able to sort of um, convert sort of technical ideas into easy to understand language for, for that non-technical audience. And that's why in the Career Accelerator, I mean, on, on the human skills, there's a, a recurring theme about 
communicating, whether that's peer to peer or within groups, but also thinking about how you would sort of communicate your findings to, uh, to a wider audience, whether that's through a written report, whether it's through words, whether it's through pictures with visualizations. Um, and so that's a really strong part of the career accelerator sort of um, DNA. And, and James, I might just ask you to, to follow on and then Viet, I'm going to throw it to you. It, mm -hmm. This relates to the question that someone has asked about, um, I suppose, learning the hows and the whys, as this person, uh, Chris, has, has put it when it comes to data pipelines. Mm -hmm. So James, first to you, um, from a academic perspective, what are some of the philosophies which are baked in that teach people how to think? And, and therefore help them answer the question of how do I go about this in the best practice way to support the, the, the problem at hand? And then Viet, off the back of that, you know, in your experience, have you come across anything that you've also found particularly useful? But James, let's, let's start with you. Sure, well, that is hows and whys. I'm gonna add hows, whys and do's, such that I would say most traditional sort of academic courses, particularly in a more quantitative sphere, perhaps focus on the, the do's. Um, uh, but I think the real perhaps, sort of unique feature of the Career Accelerator is that yes, there's the do's, but we also have the, the how's and the why's. And starting from that basic, what questions do you need to ask of your data? How should you interrogate the data? Um, because you need to know where you're headed in order to know in which direction to, to start heading off uh, into. So um, coming back to my earlier point, your educators should be designing programs of study in through whatever medium in such a way that um, it's of, of value to, to the student and then they can uh, take it to, to the real world and you know, be successful in, in that respect. So um, I think a career accelerator really does it is the hows, do's and the why's, which is, I think, somewhat revolutionary in education circles when often it's just uh, an emphasis on, on the do's. Great, thanks, James. And Viet, is there anything that you'd, you'd like to add or, or point people yeah, to? Yeah, definitely. Um, I would say the why is becoming increasingly important, especially in, um, you know, um, mission critical industries, uh, such as, um, you know, financial markets, in banking, um, uh, autonomous uh, driving, um, etc. because there is, you know, as uh, more and more applications of machine learning and AI into, you know, all these automations of uh, um, normally human driven tasks, um, the explainability of the model, the accountability of the model um, of those predictions of those actions are very, very important uh, because that is why people can gain trust in, uh, you know, in the data in the model as a result of that. That is why people can sort of like, okay, um, you know, can um, can put a green light for the model into production because, you know, if anything goes wrong, there is something that can be held accountable. There is something that can be explained. So um, I think it is both um, at a somewhat cutting edge of the uh, recent developments in machine learning. At the same time, it is something that is uh, what I'm seeing has become increasingly relevant in, uh, in industry, um, a lot of industries. Great, thanks Viet. Um, for those of you that, that have asked questions around, I suppose, um, already having some skills, already having some experience and, and wondering um, how the Career Accelerator can add to your particular career prospects, um, I might sort of just build off the back of what James and Viet have talked about and that the Career Accelerator has been, as, I've, as I've, I've mentioned a couple of times, specifically designed to build out that holistic capability. And even with technical skills, we know that industry and we know that employers are looking for people that can turn that technical skill into value. And beyond that, know how, that, how they as an individual can add value within their team. They can be self-critical. They, uh, they, can, they can build their self-awareness. They can build their critical thinking capabilities. And more and more, as Viet's just talked about, being able to think about the hows and the whys beyond just getting that particular thing done is a really valuable thing out there and is a really great way to differentiate when it comes to some of those entry level opportunities uh, in particular. For those of you um, wondering about how does a program fit if you are indeed already working full time, 
Um, this career accelerator is indeed a substantial commitment. Um, it is trying to accelerate your career. That said, it is absolutely built in mind um, with some people, uh, the, the reality being that some people are, uh, of course, working full time and a number of our students, which will be getting started in January, are indeed in that situation. So the learning experience um, by way of interest is um, predominantly uh, asynchronous, which means there is a limited requirement of being face-to-face -face in a live environment. So it gives you that flexibility. There are, of course, live sessions, which everybody is um, encouraged to be at. Um, noting life happens and there are going to be times where you can't be there. Those sessions are recorded and made available for you thereafter. But every single student builds a personal relationship and works one-on-one -on -one with a success coach. And the role of that success coach is to work with you in your life circumstance to build a study plan, to build a learning approach, to make sure that you can achieve your goals based on the realities of your life. Uh, and again, there are many students that are indeed working full time um, and it's up to us to make sure that we can support you in, in achieving what it is that you would like to. So there's nothing precluding you from, from completing the program. If you are working full time, uh, that said, borrowing James's term, it's not for the faint hearted. It is indeed a material commitment of time uh, and, and energy. Uh, Omar, if I could just sort of uh, extend yeah, a couple please. of those points. So um, in reverse order. So yeah, if you're working full time, well, we have our first cohort beginning uh, in January, just, just a few short weeks uh, away. And uh, in it, you know, most are, you're going to be working professionals and it's about your balancing, of course, your full-time work commitments with the Career Accelerator. Uh, Perry is an online program and hence it's uh, flexible and you will consume uh, content um, at uh, a time of your choosing. And clearly students could be around the world in various different time zones. Clearly live sessions need to be uh, in a, a common uh, and time zone friendly um, setting. But of course, uh, you know, a lot of this, there's a lot of flexibility when studying uh, online. But also just to touch on the point about, you know, let's say you are already in a data career, you know, what's the value add of the, the accelerator? Well, um, to take the uh, inaugural January cohort by way of example, they are, I've seen um, that their profiles um, when they've uh, applied for the program and they are from very different uh, backgrounds. Clearly everyone coming into uh, this or any program of study has some prior knowledge in some field, whether that's in data or indeed in a non-data non sphere. So um, we, we look for and indeed value some heterogeneity among um, sort of course participants because the more diverse their, their backgrounds and their skill sets is that you know, there's a lot of learning from each other. No one is an expert in everything, but clearly everyone is an expert in at least in one thing that one, one likes to think. And so we have a, a lot of you know, group at work, collaborative work, you know, offline or online synchronous, asynchronous, um, um, uh, such that you, you can leverage the uh, skills of your, your peers. And I think you know, everyone can always learn, learn more. And it's about you're trying to get this, you know, the uh, end of the accelerator, this sort of holistic skill set. So inevitably, if uh, anyone coming into this, they're going to have hopefully some fairly you know, strong starting skills, at least in one or two particular areas. Um, however, there'll be other areas where they are coming in with a much lower base. So you know, where the value is, is added, I mean, which um, bits of skills um, uh, does someone um, gain value to? I mean, that will vary from participant to participant, but it's about you know, coming in with uh, various prior skills, but trying to get the sort of convergence in output such that you have a strong base across a, a wide range of areas. Again, to touch on Kelly's earlier point of the technical, the human, the communication skills, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think you know there's something for everyone really right, in the career accelerator. There are multiple things, not one thing. Some things plural. <laughs> Thanks, James. Um, Kelly, I'm, I'm going to come to you. One one more question that's come through is around: um, Does this program facilitate data science or or gaining a data science or a machine learning role? And um, <laughs> You know, the short answer is no, the career accelerator is around data analytics roles. Yes, we do start to explore machine learning and some of the, the very basic side of things of, of, of data science. So I suppose two questions for you, Kelly. Um, what are some of those capabilities and um, 
yeah, what are those capabilities that industry are looking for when it comes to data science and machine learning professionals that you think people should be looking out for? And then off the back of that, have you got a final thought that people can consider when it comes to, to progressing their data careers? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so if people wanna move beyond um, data analytics um, and start to explore the machine learning um, machine learning engineering or just sort of pure data science, predictive analytics side of things. I would say, um, you know, become well acquainted with the, with the full data science life cycle. Um, there's no shortage of resources out there. Um, you know, whether it's through MOOCs like Viet, uh, mentioned earlier, massive online open courses, massive open online courses. I'm not sure what order yep, the yep, O's are in. Um, places like Coursera, um, which will provide you with the opportunity to get more exposure to things like machine learning engineering um, and just machine learning generally. So the ability to not just derive insights from data, which I think is generally like more of the emphasis with, with data analytics, but also building products based on machine learning, commercial products for machine learning or with machine learning rather. Um, that, you know, will work in a production environment and will utilize, there are certain sort of tools and, and technologies that I mentioned earlier, which are sort of more relevant when you're building machine learning products at scale. So um, that includes technologies that are things like Docker and Kubernetes. So like the containerization tools that allow machine learning models to, to, to sort of function in a production environment at scale. So get acquainted with the engineering side of machine learning. And, and like I said, there's lots of resources out there. Um, also, you know, don't be afraid. This is kind of a wider piece of advice, but don't be afraid to reach out. As Viet said earlier, like networking is super important and I'm sure there'll be lots of opportunities in the career accelerator, but also just generally via things like LinkedIn and meetups align yourself with a mentor, like someone that, that represents the kind of career you want to be in or the kind of skill set you'd like to have, you know, you'd be, you'd be shocked perhaps at like how willing people are to share their knowledge and skills and try and upskill people that are coming up the ranks. Um, so don't be afraid to ask and, you know, ideally align yourself with someone who's doing this job day in and day out in a real world environment. Beyond that, things like um, it's always a good idea to get acquainted with cloud services as well, because most companies that are employing data scientists or machine learning engineers are, you know, storing their data in the cloud or at least are, are moving towards that. So having experience with things like AWS, Azure or GCP is going to make you more competitive as a candidate. And um, again, that's something that you can you can get certifications and things like AWS solution architecture which will just kind of add breadth to your skill set. So I would say seek out opportunities um, where possible. If, if, if data science and machine learning is more your bag, then there are lots of courses available out there. Um, Viet said there's a lot of material on YouTube, Andrew Ng, that kind of thing um, is definitely interesting and can, can help to add more strings to your bow. Um, Generally speaking, my sort of advice and thoughts for data professionals, just, just to kind of um, leave you with, with, with a little bit of uh, optimism and excitement is that you're definitely in the right field at the right time. So get excited. You've made good choices to get you where you are. Um, and you know to have an exciting career ahead. Um, I think just kind of going back to something that's come up again and again in this, in this chat is, um, you know, don't, don't focus purely on the technical side of things. It's really like the communication and, and um, soft skills piece that kind of separates the, the good from the great in this, in this sort of realm, in the data realm. Um, and a couple tips just to kind of shine in interviews and, and make a great first impression in terms of what companies are looking for relating to soft skills is, asking good questions um, and demonstrating that you're curious. So, um, you know, don't, you don't need to have all the answers, just ask good questions and employers love that because it demonstrates humility and an and, and interest in ongoing learning. Um, and that team spirit collaboration piece is so important, you know, being able to be a part of a team that brings different sort of skills to the table and hopefully a diverse range of backgrounds, viewpoints, um, you know, so really being open to working with different types of people 
and uh, curiosity for sure. And a really basic tip, since I have all of you here, this is a bit of a pet peeve or, or bugbear from my uh, point of view. If you're putting together a CV, make sure that it's no longer than two pages. <laughs> <laughs> um, you will immediately improve your employability chances if you've got a short CV that just shines is very sort of achievement oriented as opposed to task oriented. Um, I'm very happy for people to connect with me on LinkedIn and talk more about how to make themselves a really, really winning CV. But make sure it's short and sweet. Uh, CVs Amazing. in academia often go on for pages. And pages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I That's may just right. um, um, add to your point, Kelly, about you know, a curiosity. I mean, you know, LSE, um, like you know, all great universities, we have a motto. Um, our motto is in Latin, rerum cognoscere causas, if my pronunciation is any good. English translation to understand the causes of things. Basically, back in 1895, when we were founded, this is the mission statement of LSE. And I like to think that mission statement feeds into everything we do at LSE, all um, you know, programs of study. It's about trying to um, uh, create these sort of inquiring minds of students and to develop that intellectual curiosity. And I think you know, very much the Career Accelerator um, has, again, within its DNA, the goal of um, getting learners to understand the causes of things, which in a data context, um, my analogy is sort of the variation in data. Okay, whether it's text data or quantitative data, you know, um, it, it, it's different. And um, if you did a survey, you get different scores from different people. Why does that variation exist to understand the root causes behind things? And um, correlation is not causality, of course, but uh, we are mm -hmm. interested in um, causation. But also, if we have an understanding about the why, what is driving what, uh, and if we can control that um, sort of independent variable, then we can look at making predictions or uh, setting things in an optimal way. So I think yeah, intellectual curiosity um, yeah, absolutely is a, a great skill in, in any, I think, uh, walk of, walk of um, uh, or any sort of sector of employment. Um, and that's very much you know, uh, within the, the, the DNA of the career accelerator. I like DNA today is that term. <laughs> Good stuff, if I can, James. If I can yeah, add one more add. to this uh, long list of uh, kind of um, uh, inspirations uh, to this uh, as, as, aspiring, uh, you know, uh, sort of data scientists, is that if you are already an expert in your domain, in your field, whether it's healthcare or manufacturing or you know, uh, language is, uh, you know, nowadays we're talking about things like AI plus X, where X is your domain expert and AI is, it, is the data skills. It's going to be, um, I think it's going to be hugely value added to whatever that you are really passionate about by upskilling yourself, uh, you know, with, you know, education and knowledge and, you know, um, in, uh, in data science, machine learning, and bring that skills and applications into whatever that you are best at doing, whether it's healthcare, you know, um, you know, uh, whether you're a doctor or healthcare manager or um, running a factory or, you know, um, a master of, you know, ancient languages or Latin or whatever, it's, it's, it's going to be hugely, hugely valuable, um, not to the industry, but also to, you know, um, whatever that you do in your job. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Kelly gave us a, a quick laundry list there of some some quick tips. James, or had any any final tips that you'd like to share before we wrap things up? Uh, well, I mean, I'm I, I just noting in our LinkedIn profiles are in the chat, and I've got my inbox open on another screen, and I can already see some people attendees. I can see that compare the names and cross reference. Indeed, some people are connecting with me right now. So thank, thank you very much. Indeed, I will accept very very shortly. Um, well, um, yeah, it's an exciting time. I mean, and I think you know, looking to the short, medium, indeed long term, I mean, while there's uh, going to be a lot of change in the labor market in the years and decades uh, ahead, I mean, job automation we've heard um, a lot about, and really some job roles are at much greater risk of that than others. And I think you know, for, I think within our lifespans, at least now, career spans ahead, I mean, the demand for um, you know, people to be working with data, I mean, I think, you know, mentioning that that, that uh, skills uh, a deficit I think it's only going to widen 
uh, year on year, which of course for anyone wanting to get into or um, uh, uh, be sort of promoted within that sector, I think you know, the opportunities are very uh, bright uh, indeed. I say always have your realistic expectations. No one will ever be an expert in everything. Um, I think it's uh, a good to have a, a, a solid foundation uh, of sort of across the board, but inevitably you will be specializing in, in, in any one particular area. But my top tip is never stop learning. Whether you are doing a formal program of study, be it a career accelerator or something else, or whether you're just doing some independent self-study, always um, look at refreshing your skill set. Um, your MOOCs have been uh, mentioned by Viet. I think a great way of, in a bite-sized way, of always you know, keeping um, your, your brain active and always be prepared to invest some time and effort. But I think there's going to be a return on that investment of time and effort, but never stop learning. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add on to uh, James's tip is that, uh, of course, you never stop learning. And of course, uh, you should keep doing what you're best at and most passionate about, plus the AI. So the AI is the upskill of that, and it's going to kind of like accelerate and boost you in whatever that you're doing uh, or whatever you're passionate at. Wonderful. Kelly, I'm presuming that your final top tip you gave us you gave us earlier including get in touch with you directly to to help get some cv magic any last thoughts um i think uh you know we've we've covered a lot of ground here um my kind of you know my top tips are um <laughs> my favorite kind of tip um for uh, sort of job seekers everywhere or people looking to upskill in their own careers is when, you know, is, is, is going back to the networking thing, you know, make sure that you're seeking people out, broadening your network, you know, kind of touches on everything we've been speaking about, but, you know, you can never, you can never stop learning in this kind of field. Technology changes so quickly. So you've got to, you've got to make sure that you're aligning yourself with people and organizations that are going to help you grow. Um, that's really important. No, no person has all the answers for sure. And I think it's important to, to maintain that mentality as you go about this, this career. Um, but like I said, you know, there's, I don't think there's a better place to be right now as someone who's looking to, to advance their career than in the data realm. So um, yeah, I wish everyone the best of luck and I look forward to connecting with a lot of you. Wonderful. All right, folks, on that note, we're going to, we're going to call it a wrap. Um, thank you so much to everybody for attending wherever you happen to be um, and wherever that is, have a wonderful rest of the morning, afternoon or indeed uh, night. We'd love some feedback, um, so feel free to, to drop some in the chat before you take off and or look out for um, an email which is going to pop up in your inbox shortly. Uh, if, you, if you wouldn't mind, we would greatly appreciate that. In addition, we'll also be sharing with you the recording of this session and some other hopefully useful and valuable uh, information for you in days to come. We'll leave it at that. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, everyone. Thanks so much for attending once more. Bye for now.